Now, if you're trying to turn data into insights, it can seem very difficult as you are not sure where to start and how to get useful insights. It's a bit like these M&Ms here. Uh, I have a bunch of them, different colors. Try to spot the red ones. It's pretty impossible, right? We don't have colors. But when I apply the right lens, it becomes easy. Now you can just spot them. The same applies to data. When we have the right tools, we can easily transform them into insights. So in this video, I'll teach you my six step data to insight system, which will help you to go from random data to insights you can use to make decisions. Hello data people, my name is Robert and I'm here to help you understand and analyze data to make better decisions in e-commerce. And the first step is so obvious, but a lot of beginners don't make it this clear in their mind. Without this, you will be all over the place and might just give you up before you even start. So if you just start looking for data randomly in your GA4 or other web analytics, it's gonna be really hard to find something useful uh, because there's even a, a saying, if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. So basically, if you just don't know what you're looking at, you're not going to find anything useful or you're just going to torture it enough so that it'll tell you what you want to hear. That's why it's so important that you set a goal or a question that you need to answer. And the second part to this is that you need to know who's your audience. So if you're presenting insights to uh, technical people, then you probably want to add more, you know, analysis behind it, how it's done, sample size, this and that. But if you're just presenting to people that are in the business, they don't care about this nitty gritty stuff. So you need to also think about who is your target audience. Now, for example, a good question would be something like, what were our three top uh, selling products in April? That's super easy to answer and you get the, you know where to go for, for, to look for the answer also. Or another question could be something like, uh, what is the conversion rate of our Google ads in uh, last quarter? Again, very exact question uh, and quite easy to answer. Now, if you want to add a bit more layers to it and you know have a bit more deeper insights, then you could add something like, why is our Google Ads uh, conversion rate down by 5% from the previous month? So when you compare month over month, and then you can start and dig, dig deeper into the data. But again, the question is always, what's the goal and who are you serving the data? Who's the end, you know, end consumer of the data and what are they gonna do with the data? And the thing is, if you have a specific question, if you don't know how to get it from uh, your web analytics, uh, there's probably somebody in your, your organization that will. Having a clear question just makes it so much easier to ask it and that person will be able to answer much quicker. And by the way, you can just download a summary PDF of all of the steps in my system. You can grab it. It's the first link in the description. The second step is a bit sneaky and I've ignored it many times and just wasted time by looking at the wrong things. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say revenue has decreased year over year in March. Now you could just start by looking at what is contributing to the decrease. Uh, is it traffic, conversion rate or average order value? If you remember, those three are the three levers and that make up revenue. And any decrease in one of these will impact your revenue. For more information about this, you can check out this video where I'll go through them. It's really essential that you know this if you work in e-commerce, because if you don't, your colleagues might be judging you a little bit. So I, I definitely encourage you to learn these because they have such a big impact on the revenue. Now, once you look at the conversion rate, AOV and so on, you could continue by comparing the user journey report and seeing if there has been any increase in drop-offs in one of the steps. But instead of this, I would use the second step in the system and start from the beginning of the user journey. Go to the traffic acquisition report or landing page report. Have you stopped any profitable campaigns? Or maybe a big Instagram creator stopped sending you valuable traffic. More often than not, the changes in revenue happen in the beginning of the journey. It's the traffic you send to your website. Uh, and it really has a big impact. Sometimes you uh, create, uh, you set up a new campaign and send new, new users to the website, your conversion rate drops. But is that a bad thing or a good thing? Well, it depends. If you're uh, you know, generating more revenue, then it's a good thing. But it's something you need to keep an eye on. And uh, I think a lot of people start from the end of the funnel and they look at, hey, what's wrong with our website? Whereas they should first always start, well, what kind of customers, what kind of traffic are we sending to our website? 
And hey, I covered this six step system in depth in my GA4 for e-commerce course. I'll show you how to actually use it on real data and I'll go through a few examples. I really focus on the analysis and getting insights, leaving out of the, uh, all of the techie stuff. For more information, check out the first link in the description. Now, the third step in the system is probably the most important one. Without this, you, you're just making stuff up. Now, imagine I tell you my shop's purchase conversion rate is 3%. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, it really depends, right? What are you comparing it with? And that's the third step. You always have to have uh, data to compare with. If you don't have this, it's gonna be really hard to say. 3% is really great in certain industries, but really bad for Amazon. I think Amazon has a plus 13 or plus 10 uh, conversion rate. So it really depends. And it's really important that you look at data and that it's similar to the data you're looking at. So you need to compare apples to apples. Uh, for example, if you compare new customers to uh, your existing customers, then your, your existing customers will always have higher conversion rate, higher AOV than your new customers. Because these guys, they don't know you yet. These guys, they trust you. So you could not compare this uh, fairly. You can obviously look at the differences, but you cannot compare that. That's why it's always important to look at similar data. You look at year over year uh, changes, or you look one month to another, or even better, you could use something like if you run a campaign, you could compare two campaigns against each other, as long as they are similar in nature. For example, uh, if they're both introducing a new product. So those campaigns, how are they stacking against each other? That's a good comparison. That's where you're gonna get a lots of insights because once you start comparing, you will start uh, seeing differences. And those differences are are the insights. Why these differences are happening? Sometimes you can explain it with web analytics, sometimes you can't and you would need to do further research. And by the way, wait until you hear the sixth step because without it, basically all of the other steps are uh, wasting your time. The fourth step is easier said than done, but if you follow my previous steps, you should be able to start learning these. So let me show you some obvious examples. So I'm here in my Google Analytics 4 and I'm the, inside the purchase journey report or in some cases it's called user journey. And I'm just looking at some data here. I'm trying to find out if I can find something. Usually I like to take a look at the completion rate. So here you can see from this step to this step, only 23% people continued. And then uh, between these steps, it's only 20%, which is pretty low. But what's really concerning on this specific website is the fact that you have this purchase, which is 50%. So here we have people that started the checkout, but only 45% completed it. This is really low for any e-commerce shop. And there's clearly an issue. I would start and try to dig into this. So because it's in the purchase between begin checkout and purchase, I can look at another uh, report, which is called checkout journey. And it just zooms in on the same report. So you have your begin checkout and purchase, but then you have additional steps here uh, when people go through the checkout. If I look at the device category, there's no really, not anything I can see. This is about, I don't know. You can see the mobile is converting less, by far less than on desktop. So, uh, but this website in overall just has a lower conversion on mobile. But that's also the case for many shops. And then if I take a look per country, and now this is where it gets really interesting. So if you look here, we don't, uh, this shop doesn't even sell in other countries except US and Canada. But where it gets interesting, you see here. So if we go from here, add shipping, then add payment and purchase. So there's a big drop off here. But you see that 840, that's kind of, I don't know what, 60, 70% completion rate. Whereas here it's below 50%. So now I could go, hey, wait, Canada, what's going on? And I went to the website and checked it. And it's actually because at this stage, so when you added your payment, you will know also how much it's going to cost to ship the product, which in this case to Canada is like ridiculous. It's something like, between 50 and 80 dollars i think it depends where but it's ridiculously expensive so that's why you have that's why you also have a very low completion rate now i get it most of the time it won't be that obvious but you need to start looking for patterns and trends in your data and that's the fourth step spotting patterns comes with practice so you need to start doing it and you will get better after you've done a few times also the more you are uh, the more you know your area of expertise the easier you'll uh, get spotting strange stuff for example 
example, why is the first product selling more when their second product was on sale and advertised everywhere on our site? This is only once you start knowing your area better. Now, the next step, it will just make it easier for you and others to spot any patterns and trends in the data. Let me show you what I mean. Now, here's a simple table. We basically have the day of the week, the date and sales for that day. And you can see it's pretty simple. But if you look at this, can you tell me what day we had sales? Okay, you would have to go through this and then you probably would spot out, okay, this has the highest one. Okay, now, now next question. Uh, when do we have a dip in our sales? So when do we sell the most? What weekdays is uh, uh, good for us? Well, pretty hard to say, but you have to go kind of and analyze this. Compare that with a graph. We put this in a graph, then all, the, both of these questions are super easy. First of all, when do we have a sale? Probably here because, yeah, it's just the only one that has... Uh, clearly the highest uh, revenue here for that month and if we talk about when do we have our dips it's on saturday and sunday so during weekend we sell clearly just less than on uh, than on weekdays so when you visualize the data and you know how to apply each of these graphs and charts and things like that it's going to get so much easier also to extract the uh, insights from it as you can see, if you just look at your data from different angles, using different tools, it will be easier for you to spot patterns. This is why the fifth step is to visualize your data in graphs and charts. This will help you and later on others who look at the data as well. Now I'm going to be a bit dramatic here, but the sixth step is probably the most critical step because without getting it right, you just wasted a lot of time on data analysis. And while I'll show you a few examples just now, keep this in mind. Who is your audience and what is the goal of the analysis? So who is it going to serve? So this is from the first step and it's going to help us uh, with these examples. So the first example is quite traditional and a lot of people still do this. I think it's one of those hard to habits to just get rid of. Let's say this is the example and you can see this is just a slide about uh, browser cookies and it's a bit too long. Uh, imagine uh, just presenting this. This is just way too long for people to uh, understand. And if they start reading it, then they're not going to, you know, listen to you talking. So what would be better is to actually shorten it and make it really just, you know, it needs to be punchy. You don't need to tell everything in the slides. You can just put the main points and then explain that when you present. You're going to lose your audience and you're not going to be able to communicate your insights if it's just too boring or people are reading your slides. Second thing you can also do, uh, let's imagine you are presenting this slide and you really want to focus on the click-through rate, which is on the right-hand side there. And you notice that, for example, we have less clicks on the hero section here and also the pricing page. You can see there's so much data here. It's just distracts from the main point. So you need to know your main goal of that slide, not only for the whole presentation, but for that slide. What is that slide telling? What if instead you would show it this way? You start with the title that already explains what's going on, and then you really focus only on the parts you want to tell. That's part of your story. That's the, you know, your focus point. You can see how much easier it is to comprehend this. First of all, there's only the relevant information. So click through rate and the clicks. Uh, and then you highlight the ones that you want to show. Not like in the previous slide where you have a bit of everything. No, you just really zoom in on, on the, the parts you want people to see. If you need to add later on, if you have, you know, data people on your team that really want to go through the nitty gritty, you can add that to appendix and then, you know, just mention it somewhere here down with a little text that that's OK. But you don't need to add everything here. And the third example I have is, for example, uh, when you start, you know, you have a presentation. What a lot, a lot, most people do is they just start stating the facts. So you have here sales for quarter one, they dropped. Then you see here, you know, you want to show the click through rate. So this is the slide for click through rates. And then the, you have the slide for January email campaign performance. Now, if you just uh, skim through this, you, you're not completely understanding what's going on, like what, I, what I'm supposed to focus here. What instead, those three slides, they would look like this. Uh, you would actually explain here as a story. OK, so we notice sales are down in quarter one. So you can see here 12 percent. Maybe you even add it here in the title. Then you continue. Uh, we saw it. It was caused by lower clicks on pricing page. And you can see here pricing is down. So it's one of those highlighted uh, parts. And also here we have the appendix if you want to see the whole table. 
this title is maybe a bit too long. I'm just trying to show you that you can tell a story within the slides. So, and then you conclude the story in, and it turns out we disabled January email campaign. And then you just show that, hey, there's a big drop in the campaigns. You see how you can tell a mini story. It's not the most exciting, but it's just so much easier to remember and also follow along your presentation when you have some sort of a structure of a story where you go from one thing, uh, another thing happened, and then you came uh, to this conclusion. This way you're able to communicate your insights just more effectively. And that's the sixth step. You need to learn how to communicate your insights. Otherwise, your stakeholders won't be able to use your data or you are not going to be able to convince others to take an action on the insights you've gathered. Now, presenting your data to your stakeholders is a skill on itself. That is worth learning. If you want to get things done in your company, it's a must. That's why you should watch this video next if you want to learn how to present your insights effectively so that your stakeholders and coworkers can make better decisions based on your insights.